Greg's speaking again today. Hooray! Or not. No, he's changed his mind. Awesome. Well, Father, we thank you for, for Greg, Lord. We thank you for uh, his heart for you, uh, his heart for this community, his heart for people, Lord. We just pray a blessing over the words uh, that he has to share. We just thank you, Holy Spirit, that you would give us ears to hear uh, what you're saying today. We just bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Got my cheer squad over there. How is everyone? Good. Everyone well? I've just come out of COVID again, round two. I think half the church are in COVID round two at the moment and probably half the city. Um, But God is good, isn't he? He is good. Well, I want to start by recapping. I spoke two weeks ago, and so I'm going to start by recapping, and then we're going to dig a bit deeper today. Who was here two weeks ago or who's had a listen? Number of you? Well, two weeks ago, I spoke about love. Now, when we think about love, we often think about this emotional, romantic kind of love. The love that I talked about is not that kind of love. It's a kind of love that's sacrificial, that goes over and above, that acts and that responds. It's a love that actually looks like something. It's not a love that's just inside, because a love that's just inside, I'm not sure is actually love. Love should cause us to move and act and respond. See, if love was just a feeling and an emotion then feelings and emotions come and go, but love can't come and go, can it? The kind of love that Jesus demonstrated was a love that moved him to respond to people. It moved him to go and hang out with the people that society rejected. He'd hang out with the prostitutes. He'd hang out with the singers. He'd hang out with the tax collectors. And you can translate that into anyone that's rejected in our society today, and that's where he'd be hanging out. I doubt he'd be hanging out here. That's right. Unconditional love. You're exactly right. That's who he was and that's how he acted. And so if I look at Jesus, in love he came to earth, in love he acted, in love he spoke, in love he responded and in love he goes to the cross and dies so that we too have the opportunity to love. That's what he spoke about. Love is not motivated by receiving. Love is motivated by giving. See, too often we cost ourselves only to the measure that we're willing to get something back. Think of those times that you love or you go outside maybe your comfort zone. I reckon we move outside the comfort zone because we know how much is on offer if we do. And so we love to the measure that we get something back. I'd say the more that we get back, the less likely it looks like love. If our motivation is what can I get out of this, if I do this for you, will you do this for me? If I do this, will I get more followers? Will I get more likes on my social media? Will I get more praise? Will I get more platforms? All of those things motivate us to love, but I think the more we get out of it, the less it looks like love. And so I talked about that our purpose, I believe, is not found in our job. I don't think it's found in our ministry or mission. I don't think it's found in the platform that you look at. See, what we do is we look at all these people that we admire, and especially on social media, it's created this following of people that we admire. And we look at these things that people are doing, and that, that might, be, they might be wealthy, or maybe they're a business person, or maybe they've got uh, lots of followers, they're a celebrity on Facebook, or maybe they've got a platform, maybe they speak to thousands of people, maybe they're in some sort of mission or like the Heidi Bacons, Heidi Bakers or people like that, that we follow, and we look at their life and we say, if only I had that, then I would find purpose. And so we spend all our life searching for this aimless purpose that we never really get. And I would say half of those people at least that get to these platforms and things like that still feel like they're searching for this elusive purpose. Because I don't think our purpose is found in the position It's found in the mission that we take into each and every situation that we go into. That's what he's calling us to. So I spoke about our purpose being love, that Jesus' purpose was love and he calls us to do the same thing. And so love is supposed to move us into action. 
Now, as I recap, so there was two main examples that I shared about love. The first one was the story of the Good Samaritan. So the Good Samaritan, in summary, there was a guy that was, um, was robbed, beaten, abused. All these religious people walk by and ignore them. And the person that was least likely, the Samaritan, ends up helping the least likely person, the Jew. And so the summary is Jesus is calling us to a love that looks like the least likely person helping the least likely. And so I talked about whoever that is in your circumstance, whoever you think is the least likely person to love, it's probably the one that is calling you to love and everything else in between. So all of a sudden, Jesus takes the box that we thought love was supposed to meant to be in. And so we've just loved inside our nice, healthy Christian communities and in our nice life hubs, in our comfort groups, in our friendship circles. And Jesus blasts that box open and says, all of a sudden now love, there's no conditions on love and no limits to love. And the love that I'm requiring for you is to actually go out and love the least likely person. That's what he's calling us to at you and I. The second story I shared was from Matthew 25. And in that uh, story, he basically says, hey, whatever you do for the least of these, you do for me. And so he uses the context of uh, feeding the hungry and giving a drink to the thirsty and clothing the naked and healing the sick and helping the people in prison. But the context is, actually, if someone's in need, that's the one I'm calling you to. And when you do that, you actually do it for Jesus. So we have the love your Lord your God with all your heart, soul and mind and love your neighbour as yourself. And Jesus says that they are equal. So one is unto the other. So when I love someone, I'm actually doing it unto Jesus. That's what he's calling us to. Then he goes on later down the track and he's sharing this story about saying, actually, what you do for the least of these, you do for him. So the moment I step outside my comfort zone and help someone is the moment Jesus receives it unto himself. Isn't that amazing? The hard part to read is that the moment I don't do that is the moment I don't do it for Jesus. And that's confronting. It's confronting because we know that every day we make decisions not to. We make decisions to do the wrong thing. We make decisions to uh, not be helpful or to have that snarky comment or all those sort of things where we're making decisions for self and not for others. And he's calling us to move beyond self into loving others. So if you were there two weeks ago, did you find it challenging? Yep. Maybe you're still wrestling with it. More importantly, what did you do with it? Because it's easy to hear a message that challenges us. Truth is easy to hear. Truth is hard to respond to. So it's no good coming to a Sunday morning and hearing truth or hearing a good message. And Brad's always up here sharing. It's no good for us to come on a Sunday and hear this message and do nothing with it during the week there's no point in being here. If we're not doing anything with what we get, if we're reading the Bible in, our, in the mornings or evenings or whenever you feel like opening it and you're hearing truth and you're not responding to it, then what's the point even doing it in the first place? I just challenge you in that and that's what we're going to talk on a bit more today. So I've been challenged. I hope you heard in my message two weeks ago that what I was saying to you was challenging me. And I think that's the feedback I got from most of you. I was challenged. And so these past two weeks, I've continued to be challenged. What does love look like in this moment? And I've continued to have the Holy Spirit. And I had my own Good Samaritan moment this past week that I want to share with you. Now, so last Sunday, I didn't realise I was going to be speaking today. So thank God for the illustration. Um, so last Sunday, uh, after church, uh, Marika was at Lilia Haven, so I was taking the kids, and I had a bunch of errands to run up towards the city. And so if you've got kids, you know they don't like getting in the car to do things that the parent wants to do, and so I bribed them with a slushy. So I said, if you behave yourself, and thank God, that slushies are cheap. 
And so they endured about two hours in the car for the sake of a slushy. So we get in the car and we head up, we ended up getting something from Marketplace. Then we went over to another house and they have, uh, their whole backyard was full of basically like a garden centre, but it was someone's backyard. And so we get some fruit trees uh, for our backyard, which was great. Um, and then I said to the kids, cool, we've, we've done all that, now it's slushy time. So I'm out the front of the house. I put into the phone the maps program and I say near a 7-Eleven and it's one minute away, thank goodness. And so, you know, they're always in the car. The kids are saying, when are we there? When are we there? Even five minutes is too long, but one minute, that was fine for them. And so it's one minute away. So we get in the car, we start driving, we turn the corner. We're just in a normal residential street and there's a footpath on the side. So I'm driving along. It's funny, whenever I picture myself, I have to picture the right angle I was driving. So I'm driving along, the footpath is on the side. I'm driving down and I see this lady walking down the road. She's walking down the footpath, sorry. And she's hobbling a bit. I'm a people watcher. It's one of my um, the things that my wife doesn't like about me. <laughs> she's not here today. So I'm... People watch, she's walking and she's hobbling a bit. I'm thinking, I wonder why she's hobbling a bit. Um, and then, so I'm thinking, should I see she's all right or not? So I'm driving along and then I look a bit further and then she's holding this phone out. And so she's leaning down um, up against this sort of little bushy area at the front of a house and she's got her phone out and she's leaning down like this. And then I see around her shoulder, she's got this satchel. So straight away I think, oh, she must be one of those, like the meter reading people, and she's looking at the meter reading thing, um, and that's what she's doing, and she's probably got a disability, and so if I stop and say, hey, you okay, it's just going to be really awkward for me, and so I keep driving. It's my Good Samaritan story, and then the conviction comes about 30 metres down the road. So I've driven past about 30 metres and the conviction comes from my message. It's probably the Holy Spirit saying, hey, what did you just speak about last week? You know, it's easy for us to find excuses, isn't it? It's easy. There's lots of excuses. The kids are tired. They've been in the car for a long time. I don't, what if I embarrass her by saying something? So all of this happens and I'm like, no, I just preached on this. I need to stop and check she's all right. So I, I pull the car over. The kids are like, what's, what's going on? Why aren't we getting a slushy? I'm like, just hang on. I'm just going to go see if this lady's okay. And so I go over, and as I'm walking up to her, she's probably about 10 metres away, I'm this random guy walking up to a lady. I didn't, I'm, I'm behind her as well. So I'm thinking, I don't want to scare her, so I start calling out. I'm like, hello, are you okay? And she goes and she sits, she sits back down. I'm like, hello, are you okay? My name's Greg, just checking you're okay. And then she lays back down. And I'm like, hello. And so I walk up to her. She's completely unresponsive. And I'm like, what's, hello, hello, hello. I feel her pulse and she's got a pulse. And I'm like, I couldn't see any other signs of life. And so I go to get my phone. The neighbour from across the road comes out and he's like, um, do you need any help? What's going on? I'm like, can you call triple zero? And so I go back to her. I'm feeling her neck. She's not breathing. Um, she's got like a faint pulse. And so we get onto the phone with the ambulance. Another lady who's driving by sees this strange guy leaning over a girl wondering what's happening. So she stops and comes running over. Um, and then so the, we take her out of the sun, put her in the shade. And then what happens, we end up doing CPR for five minutes um, as a result of the triple zero call. And so I'm pumping away uh, for five minutes. So before we started doing this, she starts going blue in different areas. So she started losing oxygen, do CPR for five minutes. Um, we switch between a couple of us. And then eventually uh, the blue starts going away. Um, the, she starts moving eventually and she starts coming to, and just as the ambulance comes. And so it ended up that she just overdosed on drugs. She had needles up her arm, she had blood on her arm. And so it's easy for us to have excuses, isn't it? And then to see the outcome thinking, man, like, that, I could have kept driving. And who knows what would have happened. 
And so it's, it's easy for us to hear truth and to dismiss it and not to act on it. But what I want to talk about today, because as I was talking last week, um, no, sorry, as I was hearing from many of you two Sundays ago and in the week after that, this was the summary of what I heard from you. I had probably like an overwhelming response and it was, thank you, I think. Thank you, I think. That was the summary of what everyone said. Because truth is confronting, isn't it? Like we all hear these messages, we hear messages Sunday after Sunday and we hear truth and we know the reality of what has just been spoken to us. It's either true and we have to act on it or it's not true and why are we bothering about following this Jesus guy that is giving us direction. And so I'm going to dig a deep bit, bit deeper into that truth today because it's important for us to understand that truth is uncomfortable. Truth is uncomfortable. And the moment we think that we want to stay in comfort is the moment we're going to dismiss truth and we're going to come up with every sort of reason that we uh, feel like to not engage with truth. Truth is very uncomfortable because truth and comfort are on opposite ends of the spectrum. Now, when I think of comfort, I always think back to a prophetic word that was shared. So a prophetic word is a word that um, when someone feels like they've heard something from God for someone, they share it. We call it that prophetic word. And so whenever that happens, if someone says, hey, I've got a word from you, I naturally pull out my phone and record it because I've got a hopeless memory. And also because I want to hear that time and time again. So there's this one word that I've listened to at least 50 times. And it was uh, spoken from a conference, so it was recorded as well on video. And I've cut it up and just at the end of what he was saying, I left that in there into a prophetic word. This is what he said. God's presence is the safest place. But safety with him does not translate as being comfortable. You are completely safe with God, but that doesn't mean you're called to be comfortable. Isn't that true, isn't it? See, what's happened, I think, as believers in Christian communities, we've tried to put comfort back in there. We've tried to put safety and comfort together. And so what we end up doing is we create these communities of comfort, we create these groups of comfort, we create these programs of comfort and we end up spending our life as Christians in comfort. And so when we hear truth that puts us outside of comfort, we all say amen, hurrah, and then we dismiss it. I don't think we intentionally dismiss it. I think we choose comfort. And if I read Scripture, the truth in Scripture, the truth that Jesus spoke is so uncomfortable It just pushes us outside of these nice, safe communities. It pushes us outside of a comfort. It forces us to deal with a mess in our life. And that's uncomfortable. But we're completely safe with him. We're completely safe with God, but doesn't mean we're called to be comfortable. Now, I can't recall a story of anyone in Scripture that lived a comfortable life, that followed Jesus with all they had. I can't recall of one example. So you have these disciples, they're followers of Jesus. You can read about them in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And so they're following Jesus, they're giving their all to him and they're continuing to see Jesus is um, attacked, persecuted and eventually he goes um, to the cross for the sake of his faith. And then we see it play out in the book of Acts which is where we see what happens with these followers of Jesus. And straight away, Jesus goes back to heaven. Straight away, persecution comes. So straight away, they're having to count the cost of the truth that Jesus spoke in their life. They're having to count the cost. All of a sudden, it's not rosy Jesus parties. All of a sudden, they're having to make the choice, are they really a follower of Jesus or not? 
And so we have these disciples, most of which were killed for their faith. Some beheaded, some crucified, some hung. And we look at those things and we champion them. And then we come into our modern day Christian setting. And we have nothing in comparison to them. Nothing in comparison. This is what Paul endured. So this is in 2 Corinthians, which is a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. It says, Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. So 40 lashes was supposed to kill someone. It's these strands of leather with these uh, rocks and bones and stuff in it. So 40 lashes is supposed to kill someone. 40 lashes minus 139 is supposed to not. So five times he endured that. I think Jesus only endured it once. Paul endured it five times. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Isn't that incredible? So this is not a disciple of Jesus. This is not someone that got to spend his life with Jesus. This was someone that hated Jesus, that hated the followers, that persecuted them, that has an encounter with Jesus like we get to have an encounter with him. And our life changes. And this was the result of him following Jesus. I think it's not necessarily as much about the culture that he was in, but more about his passion to follow Jesus. I think if we follow Jesus in the same way that Paul followed Jesus, I think we would have far higher persecution than we do right now. Now, we live in in a, a great country. It's very easy for us to stand up for truth and be persecuted right now. We're, we're in that point now. But very rarely do we stand up for truth. Now, standing up for truth doesn't dismiss love. Love and truth coexist. So standing up for truth doesn't mean I don't love. If I think of Jesus, um, the woman that was caught in adultery and comes before Jesus, and um, Jesus talks to the, the religious leaders, and it's like, if you're without sin, then cast the stone. So in that moment, Jesus loved, and then truth comes in and says, hey, go and sin no more. Love and truth can coexist together. So it's not saying that we're supposed to go out and hate on the people that aren't standing up for our truth. We can stand out for truth and start seeing truth in our life and implement that and move forward with that. And persecution is going to come, but that doesn't mean we don't love. Love has to be the first priority in everything we do. But love doesn't compromise truth. Love doesn't compromise truth. Jesus is that truth. If you get nothing out of, um, if you get nothing more than what Jesus wrote in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I think you'd be heading in the right direction. If that's all you got was the words of Jesus from the Bible, I think you'd be, if you got that in your life, man, you'd be way above anyone else that I know. Like, if you, if you just got that, if you just got what Jesus said, we would be far, our lives would be completely different. I think we would be sold out. I think our relationships would be healthier. If we just got the words of Jesus, the truth that he spoke. This is in John eighteen thirty seven. So Jesus has got arrested, and this is Pilate speaking to Jesus. And he says, you're a king then, because everyone's calling him this king. You're a king then, said Pilate. And Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born 
and came into this world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. So Jesus comes to testify to truth, to live truth. And if we're on the side of truth, we're going to listen to Jesus. His are the words of life. And so as much as I can, I spend my time when I'm in Scripture reading the words of life that is Jesus. I want to get him into me. I want him to come out of me. And if I don't understand truth, that's not going to come out. Now, it's easy for us to read truth and to skip over it. We read it as a good story. We read it as a a nice thing to do. We read it because we've ticked our box for the day and we've done our Bible study. But if we let it, truth will agitate us. Truth will get deep within us and it will start agitating us. Truth is uncomfortable. It's so uncomfortable. And what I, my encouragement to you is don't dismiss the agitation for the sake of comfort. Don't dismiss it. My hope for my life is I let agitation stay there for the rest of my life. Because the agitation that comes from truth is meant to move us towards Jesus. It's meant to realign our life towards it. And I think of that agitation, it's the Holy Spirit, really. The Holy Spirit is rumbling inside there saying, hey, this is for you. Hey, this is for you. Hey, you need to get this into your life. Hey, see this area of your life? Hey, it's not right. It's not aligned with Jesus. So if I think Jesus, if I think of Jesus as my true north, the Holy Spirit, what he does is he, he directs us back towards him. He directs us back to the truth. And so as we go off track, if we allow it, the, old, the agitation or what we feel from him in this conviction, it's going to point us back towards him. The same as when I read scripture, the scripture is going to agitate us because we know that we weren't designed for the way that we're going. We know that we were designed for the way of Jesus and so it's going to agitate us back into that direction. But if we're going to be this community that sits in comfort, we're going to dismiss the agitation. We're going to dismiss the truth. And yes, it will be joyful and wonderful and we'll have happy Christian gatherings And we'll have wonderful life hub groups and wonderful prayer gatherings and wonderful friendship. But the mission of Jesus will not happen. If we sit in comfort, the mission of Jesus is not going to happen. If we let the agitation point us towards the truth, the kingdom is going to expand. Jesus is going to be glorified. The city and the families in it are going to be saved. That's what's going to happen if we let that agitation produce good fruit in our life. So what my encouragement to you is this. Don't pursue comfort. Pursue Jesus. Don't pursue comfort. Pursue truth. You know, the Holy Spirit is our guide into truth. In John 16, it says this. This is Jesus writing. He says this to his followers, John 16, 12 to 15. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, that is the Holy Spirit comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it's from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said, the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. When he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. That's this conviction that we're feeling. When we hear truth, when we read it from Scripture, when you hear someone preaching and there's an agitation that's happening inside of you, that's the Holy Spirit. And he's trying to guide you into truth if you let him. Love is choice. Love is choice. God's love for us gives us choice. So we get a choice of whether we're going to respond to the agitation that comes within us or we get a choice of whether we're going to dismiss it. 
my hope is that we start responding to him in a way that says we value truth and we're willing to go through the process to see that in our life. That's the importance of the community is to help each other as we're going through these tough times and we're having the agitation of truth and God's revealing areas in our life that need work. That's the importance of community. The importance of community is not for comfort. It's for encouragement for the mission to go and see the city transform, to go and see the kingdom come. That's what the encouragement of the community is. We come, we worship God, we learn truth and we go out and we implement it. We see the kingdom come in our workplaces. We see it come in our families. We see it come in our friendship circles. That's what it's for. That's what it's for. If I can invite maybe Andy up. What I feel is happening right now for some of you is for some of you that don't know who Jesus is. Okay, I'm speaking to you who don't know who Jesus is. Maybe you've never given your life to him. Maybe you've heard of this strange guy that people talk about. What I'm guessing is that you're feeling an agitation right now. It's a conviction. See, we were all created in the image of God's being in relationship with him. And what happens is when we hear the name of Jesus, something comes up within us. There was something that we were born for, something that we were made for, something that we were designed for. And there's an agitation that comes and it points us towards a father that we never had. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, lead you in a prayer. So if there's an agitation happening within you, I want you to know that it's Jesus, that that truth is agitating you and it's Jesus. And He's saying it doesn't matter if you don't have all your answers. I still don't have all my questions answered. But you know enough to know that Jesus must be real. And if he, he is real, then everything is different. If Jesus is who He says He is, then He deserves my all, He deserves my life, He deserves my response. And so I want to pray for you if that's you. So if you're feeling this uncertainty within you of saying, I, I know this must be truth, but there's an apprehension within me and I don't have all the answers and I don't know what that means for my life and I don't know what, what that means for the stuff I'm caught up in. I don't know what that means for my future. I wanna say to you that saying yes to Jesus is the start of a journey with Him. You don't have to have all of your questions answered. It doesn't have to be more than that. It's a yes to who you know He is today. It's a yes to the agitation within you that He is something that you want to pursue. And when you say yes to Jesus, He comes and meets with you. So just ask that everyone have their eyes closed right now. What I'm going to ask is that if, if that is you and you wanted to say yes to Jesus this morning, dismiss those questions dismiss the uncertainty I'm going to ask you to raise your hand just everyone's eyes are closed I want you to raise your hand just for a moment just so I know who I'm praying for thank you Jesus thank you Jesus thank you Jesus yep I can see you Last chance. Anyone else? Thank you, Jesus. You can put your hands down. I'm just going to pray. If you if you put your hand up, I ask you just you pray this within your spirit. You can pray it out loud if you want to. 
just repeat after me in your spirit out loud, whatever you want to do. Just say, Jesus, I choose today to give my life to you. I don't have my questions answered, but I'm willing to do this journey with you. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I receive your forgiveness and I have just been made right before you. Please work in me. Please work through me. Please help me in my day to day. I thank you that your word says you're with me. And I receive that. Jesus, I just pray for each person that raised their hand just now. Father, I thank you for their life. Father, I thank you for their life. I thank you that they are daughters and I thank you that they are sons of a loving Father now. I thank you that you chose them. I want you to hear these words as if I was speaking straight to you. Father, I thank you that you chose them. I thank you that you love them as they are. I thank you that there is nothing in their life now or in the past or in the future that can separate them from you. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would come right now, that you would fill every person here that just raised their hand. Holy Spirit, come and baptise them. Come and baptise them. Holy Spirit, come and just overwhelm them. Holy Spirit, come and overwhelm them with your love and your power. We thank you for freedom. We thank you for wholeness. We thank you that from today onwards, things are different that you are no longer what you were the moment you walked in here, but now you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. You have been set free from the power of sin and death. And now you walk in the light that Jesus is your light. He is your Saviour. He is your Lord. And He's taking you in a new direction on a new path. And He's going to guide you. The Holy Spirit is going to guide you each and every way. And so I pray right now, God, that as they hear your voice, as they hear that prompting, as they feel that agitation, that they would say yes to you, that say, they would say yes to and they would respond to you. I thank you that they are not alone. I thank you that you are with them. And I thank you that whenever they come across hard times, I thank you that you are with them. You will never leave them nor forsake them. And so I pray for God's blessing over your life. Each person that responded, I pray for God's blessing over your life, for His favour to come upon you, for His love to overwhelm you, for His Spirit to guide you, and for His power and grace to overcome every obstacle that you will face. And so, Father, I just pray for everyone in this building that we would not forego truth for the sake of comfort, that we would allow that agitation to build up within us. Jesus, Jesus. That we would allow that agitation to build up within us. That we would see Your truth in our life, that we would no longer just settle for comfort, but we would instead say yes to You, we'd endure for You, we'd overcome for You. Spirit, I just pray for your ministry right now to come. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Overwhelm us with your love. Yeah, I just I just pray, God, that you would just continue what Brad was praying after worship. That you would come and minister in a way that sees those things from the enemy flee and sees the power of Jesus reign in this place, that the power of Jesus would reign in every life here, that He would touch every darkness and it would flee in the name of Jesus. He would touch every trial and it would leave. He would touch every obstacle and it would come down. Father, I thank You that You go after everything in our life that is not of You. And I thank You that in that, that Your love overwhelms us. 
May your love overwhelm each person here, God. Thank you, God. Jesus. Feel free to sit or stand. what it is in your life that needs to be overcome. Just declare in the name of Jesus. You don't have to understand it, but there's power in the name of Jesus, in that declaration of the name of Jesus. And He's going to see change in your life just by singing the name Jesus.
glorious and you are wonderful and your name is powerful. I thank you that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords and yet you call us your friends. We receive you as our Lord and our friends. We receive you as our brother. I thank you that you have called us. I thank you that you have chosen us. I thank you that there is nothing that can separate us from your love. No height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation can separate us from your love. No sin, no failure, no flaw. Nothing that we could ever come up with can separate us from that love. And so I thank you for that love and we receive that love. Thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace that moves us beyond forgiveness and causes us to change direction into a new way of thinking, a new way of acting, a new way of living. So today marks a day that we choose a new way, that we choose your truth and we choose to walk in that direction. I thank you for your forgiveness when we're going to go off track. But I thank you that we get to keep coming back in forgiveness. And I thank you that each day is going to be better. And we choose to pursue you, Jesus. We choose to pursue you in our life. I pray for your blessing over each person here, God. That they would meet you in the daytime and they would meet you in the nighttime. They would hear your voice. They would understand it. And they would act upon it. Jesus, would you speak with your loud voice? Would you speak with your clarity? Would you speak with your truth? And would you guide us onto the right path? We choose to listen and respond and to walk in your direction. So I pray for your blessing over each person here. I pray for your blessing over their journey. I pray for your blessing over their ears to hear and their eyes to see. I pray for blessing over their decisions. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, may our life glorify you in every area. We pray these things to bless the name of Jesus in our life and our city. You are worthy to be praised, Jesus. Amen. If you prayed a prayer today, I encourage you to come forward and receive prayer. There's some wonderful people that will be up here that I trust to pray over you. They would love to bless you. I encourage you to make it known to someone that uh, you gave your life to Jesus this morning because it's important that you don't just get prayer, but that you have people to journey alongside. So I encourage you to make that something that you do and get outside of your comfort zone that we talked about. Uh, there's going to be morning tea outside. I think it's uh, toasted sandwiches. $2 if you can't afford it. I'm sure someone will sort you out. Uh, there's coffee and tea. Please stay. Please get to know people in this wonderful community. God bless you.